I have to admit, I was pretty surprised by this statement. I, yeah. I stood for three hours at a train track with someone once with them behind me and their hands on my shoulders and me yelling at them to push me into every train that came by because they were so afraid that they would kill people on train tracks by just pushing people all the way down the line onto the tracks and the train would just run them over. How does that compare to what you think of when you think of psychotherapy? And why would somebody do it this way? Let's listen. Now, I will tell you, Robert, I was not afraid. And, and I'd be more afraid of somebody without OCD behind me on a train track than I would be of somebody with OCD on a train track. Because I know the person with OCD is going to do everything they possibly can to make sure that nothing bad will ever happen. So who the heck is this guy yelling at people to push him onto the train tracks? This is Dr. Patrick McGrath. He's a renowned expert in obsessive compulsive disorder, and he has well over 20 years of experience in the field. What makes you good at working with OCD? The best compliment I've ever received ther from a therapeutic kind of stance is, I can't believe you don't have OCD because you think like you do. Unfortunately, many people still don't truly understand OCD. But Dr. McGrath does. And in this episode, he shares his passion and experience with you so that you can too. We talk about trust your gut, right? You know, if, if you feel it, it, it must be true. But the reality is, is that OCD is the great manipulator. And OCD manipulates your fight, flight, or freeze response, your feeling center. OCD is not a logical problem. Again, it's an emotional problem. And, and the location of OCD, in, even in the brain, more in the midbrain than anything else. Right now, OCD is still very much trivialized by society. OCD became the butt of the joke for a lot of people. Even though the World Health Organization at one point in time has listed OCD as one of the top 10 most disabling conditions in the world, we've put a spin on it that says, oh no, you know what OCD stands for? obsessive Christmas disorder. And we put that on t-shirts and sweatshirts at Christmas time. <laughs> but stick around for this amazing interview with Dr. McGrath and you'll learn the following things. One, how to dispel some of the biggest misconceptions about OCD. Two, the most and least effective treatment approaches. Three, practical advice for managing OCD. And four, a new tool that is revolutionizing OCD treatment in the United States. Okay, everybody, I am very excited to bring a guest for you today. I have Dr. Patrick McGrath. Um, he is a leading authority on OCD with over 20 years of experience. He's the chief clinical officer at NoCD. We'll talk more about that, but it's an online platform providing accessible therapy for people with OCD using licensed therapists. He also hosts his own show, Get to Know OCD, the podcast. And he's been able to sit down with people like John Green, Howie Mandel, and others to discuss their personal experiences with OCD. Aside from these things, he's also authored some books, been featured on TV like Discovery Channel and TLC. So Dr. McGrath, you are a busy man. Thank you for taking some time to sit down with me. Thank you. Uh, th this is a always a welcome time. I love chatting about my favorite topic in the world. So Your favorite topic in the world. That's great. <laughs> what, should I, what should I be calling you? Do you want to Dr. McGrath, uh, Patrick, Patrick, Pat, Pat, Patrick, Patrick, okay. Patrick is and, Robert not is Pat. Also Saturday Night Live destroyed the name Pat, and I have not gone by Pat since that skit came out. So yeah, no. That's really. that's very funny. Okay, perfect. Patrick is great. Robert is great for me. I hate doing that. Awesome. Doctor, 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 doctor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I always like to get a little bit of context, you know, from guests before jumping into the meat of what we're talking about. Um, do you mind if I ask, like, what got you on the mental health path in the first place as your career? I was uh, Lucy uh, with the five cents, please, as, a, as an adolescent. I had a, some friends who went to a concert, met someone, and I met her through there and, and, and hadn't met her in person. They were talking to her on the phone, and then somehow the phone got handed to me, and we got into this very deep conversation, and she said, can I talk to you again? And I was like, sure. And I, I started doing therapy at 14 uh, years old. And then suddenly my number was being handed out to other people and other people were calling me that I'd never met before who said, I know so-and-so said you were very helpful. Can I ask you some questions? I was like, sure, go ahead. <laughs> so uh, that, that started the process. And after a while, I thought, maybe this is what I'll do for the rest of my life. And it, it is what I've done for now 25 years. Wow. Do you feel like prior to that, were you always more in tune than other kids, for instance? Is this just a natural development from who you are as a person? I'll say prior to that, I was a very nervous kid. I threw up every day of first grade. So it's funny that I I eventually in my career opened up a school anxiety school refusal program from the kid who was really, really anxious um. uh, in, in school. Uh, I also think, 
even going into, uh, went to a Catholic grade school, but we, a public school for kindergarten, and we had a test into the Catholic school. And they had four groups. They had the Cardinals, who were the really cool kids. And then they had the Blue Jays. They were almost as cool. Then the Robins were kind of the average kids. And myself and four other kids were the Sparrows. We were kind of put in the corner uh, at a table and mostly forgotten about for most of the time, just being seen as you are the people who will not develop or do much in life. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, um, that was a really, I, I always said, if I, if I write an autobiography, it's going to be called I Am a Sparrow, because that was a really telling thing, at, even early on in my life, being like, wait a minute, I, why are they doing that? Because I can do that too. I don't know why. I, I'm not able to do what everyone else is doing. And, and I think that's what led to a lot of my anxiety and why I was throwing up every day too, because I'm, I'm here at school and I'm being treated as if I have very little potential or knowledge or smarts whatsoever, but I know that I'm more than this. I didn't know how to say it though. I didn't know how to express it other than anxiety. So I, I think I took a lot of the experience from that, you know, by second, third grade, I had moved up to the right groups and levels and things like that. And no finally showed, yeah, I was no longer a sparrow, but I, I showed some progress maybe. But I think I really was affected by that. And to this day, uh, I, I have always wanted to kind of be a voice for the people who are anxious and whose lives are being impacted by anxiety and and show them that they can really live the life that they want to live and not the life that anxiety is demanding of them. And if I can help to be that voice for people, I want to continue to do that. Yeah. I've, you know, been able to look at a variety of things that you've put out, some of your podcasts, other appearances, and the mm -hmm. passion for what you do comes through a lot. So it's 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 Thank obviously you. from comes from the heart, it seems like. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. At home, was mental health talked about? No, not really. Uh, at home, it was either uh, the one side of the family who were all police officers or priests and the other side of the family who ran all the cemeteries. So there was there was a lot of more just uh, either pray about it or walk away from it, you know, walk it off kind of thing. There was yeah, there was up. nothing else in the middle middle of it whatsoever other than those two things. So I'm probably a. Uh, to this day, I'm kind of an odd one out in the family. I think that uh, <laughs> they've come around a lot, you know, in the, in the last 50 years uh, from from where I was. But I really, I really wasn't kind of raised in the sense that we ever talked about therapy or mental yeah. health or any anything like that whatsoever. So you you stumbled into this from feeling like an outcast in some ways. That nervousness translating into a variety of different things like throwing up, you know, school refusal, things like that. And then, you know, from your experiences and talent, you started to have more of a passion for actually helping people get through their own struggles. That and, and bullying too was a big piece of it. I was, uh, I was a nerdy kid. I had zits, I had allergies. I was, you know, blowing my nose all the time. Uh, you know, and it just, I, I had a, I had a kid in my grade school class who one day uh, just beat the crap out of me and then had poured a can of tear gas in my face, uh, oh my liquid God. tear gas. And I, I hit this amazingly low point in my life right there. That was probably Absolutely. one of the That's lowest no points in my life. No, it was, it was pretty bad. And I, I even thought, I, I don't even want to be here anymore. I mean, this is not a, it's not a world I want to live in where this kind of thing happens, but Luckily, I was in eighth grade and I knew I was going to be going to high school. And I thought I get a chance to reinvent myself at a high school where I'm going to, which is far away from my grade school where almost nobody I know will be at. And I really took advantage of that. And I really did kind of reinvent myself. I, I joined band, which I, I know sounds also very nerdy. Which, what, what did you play? But, uh, trombone and baritone. Yeah, uh, I was, was a percussionist. Uh, there you go. Uh, were you a Rush fan then? Because Neil Peart oh, is yeah. God, of course. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, uh, in in fact, I have right here my my Neil Peart bobblehead right next nice. to me. Just, just nice. Yeah. Um, but it was great because I met a group of people in band, and then I also met a, some kids from some other schools that were on the bus every day with me, 
And I became, uh, I, I think, me 2.0 in, in some ways where it was like, okay, this is a fresh start. Nobody really knows me. And uh, there were some bumps and bruises along the way, obviously, but it was great because I, I left high school a different person than I was in my entire life. I'd go back to high school today in a heartbeat if I could. Mm -hmm. It was so much fun, such a great experience. And, uh, and it's at that point where I, I then started becoming the therapist to other people then as well too. So yeah, I, I found my voice is, is what really happened. And it was, it was an amazing experience to get to do that. Great. It, yeah. It's also a really good example of the kind of, it can get better. It doesn't always get better for everybody, but it definitely can. And yours is a good picture of how it yeah. can actually play out. Yeah. Where did OCD start to come in? Where Where is the interest in OCD in that story or later on in that story? So uh, it's a story of failure, actually, which sounds weird, but... The best ones are? The best ones are, yeah. So if you look at me, I go to college now and I go to a really small college and I am probably the one of the top two psychology students in in my class i i win one of the awards at the research conference i do this amazing practicum at, at an anxiety disorder clinic and i really think i am i am the dude you know uh, so i apply to <laughs> yes i am the shit I, I if we could say shit on here fine i am the shit yes yes <laughs> uh, so i apply to 15 of the top phd programs in the world and I'm summarily rejected by every single one. They are uh, tough. Yeah. They're, the people they don't are. really realize I had it's no like, idea. you know, yeah. they have five spots and like yeah. hundreds of applicants. Yeah. Yeah. I think the average was 700 applicants for like, yeah, like you said, five spots per school. Uh, I didn't even get an interview. So I apply to master's programs. I get into two. I choose one. They give me a full ride. So I was like, okay, I'll take that. And, and then I reapply to PhD programs again. I apply to another 15. I get into two, so I pick one. I then apply to 15. 15 seemed to be my number. I don't know why, but I applied to 15. Uh, Is that an OCD thing? Uh, no, I, yeah, I know. It sounds like <laughs> it's what I could afford, actually. Yeah, <laughs> it's I know. very poor. Yeah, absolutely. I applied to 15 internships. I get one offer. And then I applied to 40 jobs and postdocs, and I got one offer. And it wow. was from the St. Louis Behavioral Medicine Institute with Dr. Alec Pollard at their anxiety disorder clinic. And I was there within a week and a half of being there. I remember thinking to myself, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And it has been what I have done for the rest of my life. So, so if you look at me really on paper, well. I'm a, yeah, I, I'm a massive failure on paper. I'm like 95 uh, applications to seven acceptances, but I found my jam. And right. Or there was just one specific path through all of that noise, right? Yeah. I, and I figured out what the path was and I took it and I have run with it. And it's, it, it's always a joy when one of those places that rejected me now calls me to train their staff. Uh, I always just get a little Heck smile yeah. on my face when that happens. <laughs> but I, I found what I'm good at and I'm going to keep doing it. What makes you good at working with OCD? The best compliment I've ever received there from a therapeutic kind of stance is I can't believe you don't have OCD because you think like you do. Mm. That's great. Yeah. It is so hard to have like accurate empathy without yeah. having been through it. So that's, that's really, that is a great compliment. I would stick, I would keep that one too, if I were you. Oh, I, I cherish that one because people are shocked that I don't have OCD because they say, you say all of the things that my brain says. And I think I've just become a really good observer of the way people with OCD view the world. And I'm able to translate that back to them and they can appreciate that wait a minute if if you don't have ocd but you can understand that maybe maybe there is some hope then right maybe maybe this actually is something that could be studied and and that there there could be good treatments for it because it isn't just people who have it understanding it that there really are things out there to help it that's a great segue into maybe educating the audience a little bit about ocd can you give sort of your way of explaining what OCD is to people who have maybe seen the term media presentations yeah. of it, but don't really understand what it is exactly. Yeah. You tell people you're the chief clinical officer for an OCD company and everyone replies to you, oh, I have a little OCD. Yes. 
And I just kind of shake my head a little bit and think, am I going to go? Yes, I am going to go there again. And then I end up going there again and say, um, we all have quirks. Everybody does a couple of things a day that maybe we do twice or three times even. Maybe we jiggle the lock more than other people do or something. But that's not interfering in your life. That's not taking your life over. And you can handle that thing, right? Um, there's nothing wrong with having some quirky thing. It, it's a natural human condition. And I liken it to this. And again, I say this as an example, no offense to anyone, but I've never met somebody who's five pounds underweight who said to me, I have a little anorexia. Yeah. It's right. a, that I, it shows just, how trivializing people are about OCD as compared to some other things. Correct. Correct. And, and the problem is a lot of media portrayals of OCD are, it either helps you solve crimes or it helps you get the relationship or it's actually a superpower and it has helped you figure out things in life. I remember watching during COVID, uh, an entire newscast was out in one of the backyards of the newscasters appropriately, you know, six, eight feet apart from each other. And one said to the other at one point, wouldn't it be great if we all just had a little OCD to help us get through COVID? And I thought, I don't oh. know of another mental health condition we say would be great to have to help us get through life, right? It'd be great to have a little I mean, bit of borderline. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if you're, if you're at a funeral and everyone's sad, do you say, let's, let's all just have some mania right now or something just to, just to be in a better mood. We, we would never say that. Right. So OCD is one of those terms that's almost everybody knows and almost everyone misunderstand. And I've tried to work on making it a mission to correct that so that people know what OCD really is. So to get to your, your question, what is OCD? Well, it's three things. It's intrusive thoughts or images or urges, which I want to state right off the bat, every single person in the world experiences. I've never yes. met anyone who hasn't had an intrusive thought or image or urge. Right? Most people are able to go, oh, that was weird, okay. and move on. And some people go, mm, why did I have that? What does that mean? Is, does that say something about me? I'm not supposed to think that. And what can I do to get rid of it? And that's where a compulsion comes in. A compulsion is a mental or physical act that one does as a way to neutralize the obsession, just to be sure that in case the obsession were to mean something, that they've done something to try to distance themselves away from it so that they won't be responsible for that thing happening. So if I think, Robert, I hope the ceiling collapses on you. And then I think, oh, that's a terrible thought. And then I, you know, knock on wood or something like that. And now it doesn't happen. What have I taught myself? As long as I knock on wood, Robert will never be harmed by ceilings falling on him. And now every time we think about it, I'm just going to knock on wood and then Robert will be safe and everything will be wonderful. And that might seem cultural to us. We're used to knocking on wood, but you, you might also get a phone call as you're closing the door that says your mother fell down the stairs and you run to the hospital and you see her and she, she's okay. Uh, she's a bit bruised up and everything, but nothing broken. And you come back home and you close the door again. And you know what? It just, it just doesn't feel right. Uh, it's, it's, something's a little off. So you, you open it, you close it again. And now this time it gives that sound and it felt right. And Hey, guess what? No phone call. And what have I just taught myself? As long as I close that car door, right? Nobody gets hurt. And today I did it once, but in three months, it's going to take me hours until it feels just right to do. And, and I might even have the police call to me because it's three in the morning. I'm outside slamming my car door and my neighbor's like, what the hell is Patrick doing? Why is he? And the cops are coming and, and the police close it. And I'm like, officer, you're a miracle worker. I can't, I was trying to close. It wouldn't close. Look at you. You, the first time you do it. And then they leave. And then what do I do? I, I drive the car into the garage. I close the door and I open the door and I start slamming it again and because of course, it wasn't done right. And if it's not done right, it's wrong. And if it's wrong, somebody's going to die. And that's what it's like to live with OCD. Now, it is not rational. It is emotional. And, and that is why from a therapy point of view, we don't do talk therapy for OCD because you, you've never been able to talk a person out of obsessive compulsive disorder. You cannot give them enough information. You have to help them learn that they can handle the uncertainty and the doubt and the discomfort that OCD brings and that they can live with that without having to do compulsion. Mm. Can, 
Can you correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I, I usually sure. tell people kind of by contrast, right? Like a delusion, like you would have in say schizophrenia or different psychotic issue. Um, mm -hmm. you, you believe that to be true. That is your reality of it, which is very yeah. different from intrusive thoughts that you see in OCD because most of the time you, you know, it's out of place, right? You yep. know that it's not, you, like you said, you know, it's not logical, so you yep. can't really talk your way out of it. Is that, would you say that's accurate? The vast majority of time, there are people who have low to even what we call, call delusional levels of insight of OCD, where mm -hmm. they fully do believe in the intrusive thoughts and believe they must do the compulsion or else the terrible thing will happen. Most of the time though, most people with OCD have good to fair insight and will say to you, I know this makes no sense, but what if, right? OCD is a what if disorder. And it, it's always what if followed by the worst case scenario. I'm, I'm in a bed in your work too. You've never worked with someone who came into your office and said, you know, Robert, what if everyone loves me and thinks I'm great, right? You've, you've done no therapy session for that whatsoever. <laughs> Well, I, you know, no, not what if I've had some people with extreme mania that know that everybody totally loves different. them, totally but not different. the what yes. if. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. You, the intrusive thought and the mm -hmm. compulsion aren't always logically linked. Like you said, Correct. knocking on wood or closing the door and getting the right Ugh. out of it doesn't right. necessarily logically link to what the fear is, correct? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's even written right in the DSM as part of the definition that it does not have to have a logical thing. I mean, obviously, getting a germ on your hands and washing your hands is a logical link to something. So you could see it that way, but you can create things in your head as well, too, that if, you know, if I, if I see something and then believe something terrible will happen unless I say a prayer, um, some will say, if you're an atheist, that makes no sense. Others who are really religious will say, oh, that makes total sense too. So even there's a continuum on some of this as well too, for the way that people look at it. Is it usually trackable back to an incident like you talked about? So I'm what you said about the mom falling down the stairs and then mm -hmm. the door, what came to mind for me was sort of how superstition develops with sports, for instance. Mm -hmm. They won, you were wearing that hat, you were sitting in that place. So you learned Correct. that you got to keep doing that. Is there typically a, a, a trackable event that you can go back to to figure out the origins of this, or is it sometimes not that easy? For some of them, there can be, but then it really does take a life on and of its own where this idea that just something has to remain perfect and why it is the thing that it is, I can't always tell you, nor can the people I'm working with always tell me as well too why it's that one. I mean, I've worked with people who a piece of furniture has to be perfect, a car has to be perfect, you know, just... And they, they can't say why it's okay that anything else in their life doesn't have to be, but this thing does. It just, OCD latched onto this thing and that's the thing. That is a good segue into some misconceptions about OCD. You said okay. they might have one thing that is perfect or has to be perfect, doesn't have to be everything in their life. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of people imagine that everybody with OCD is very clean, oh, orderly, no. wash their hands. I know yeah. that's not the case. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, I get people who come in and say, well, I was told I don't have OCD because on the Zoom, the therapist could see my house and see I had a messy house. And they said, well, everyone with OCD has a clean house. Wrong. <laughs> Absolutely wrong. Yeah. Um, if your OCD is not about cleanliness, you don't care about cleanliness and it doesn't really matter, right? OCD takes on very specific things or subtypes and really focuses on those things. There's other people I've met who are really focused on cleanliness who haven't taken a shower for a year. And you might say, well, that sounds really weird. Well, but the reason they don't take a shower is they know that once they get in the shower, it's a 12 hour ritual to do. And it's so overwhelming to start because they can't stop it. They feel once they get it started. And so they just avoid it totally so that they don't even have to deal with it. Yeah, absolutely. What are some other misconceptions that you see about OCD? Things that people might get wrong about it or assumptions they make that are not necessarily realistic. Uh, yeah. Well, one of them being this idea that it's helpful in some way. You know, the reason I'm successful is because of my OCD. Uh, if that was the case, my job would be to give OCD to people. I'd, I'd go up to non-successful people and say, you know, you, you haven't been really doing well. Uh, have you thought about OCD as a way to just boost your, your productivity and your profitability for your company? Because I think 
I think a little OCD in you and all your employees would be would just be the key thing to do. No, no. Um, I I just did a a wonderful podcast interview for the Get to Know OCD podcast with Brad Feld, who's an amazing entrepreneur and so many books out and everything. And and you know, I I posed that question to him, and he got visibly angry <laughs> with the notion that. OCD has ever been helpful to anyone whatsoever. I mean, it was just, you could see the Steve coming out. He's like, I get so mad when, when I hear this kind of thing. So, um, we, again, we don't tell people to develop mental health conditions as a way to improve their life. We just don't. Where do you think that comes from? What do you make of the idea that people like to portray it as a, a key to a superpower or something like that? Mental health has been entertaining before television. Um, I did a practicum down at Jackson, in, in Jackson, Mississippi at, uh, I can't even say the name of the old place because, uh, it was so non PC <laughs> okay. that they had to change the name. Yeah. But, um, across the street from it, from Hud's, Hud, I'll just say Hudspeth is where I went across the street from Hudspeth was the Jackson state hospital. Uh, and I went over there to do some of our, you know, CPI training and, and things just to protect yourself and stuff. And I was talking to one of the people that worked there. It was kind of a historian of the place. And he said, you know, what happened in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and the reason the fence here is the way that it is, it's not a private fence. It's just bars, you know, and every six inches, there's another bar. And he said, what would happen is on Sundays after church, people would make a picnic and then come and sit outside the fence. And then the hospital would let all the patients out onto the grounds and people would just watch the, the people doing hallucinating and having delusions. And that was, that was Sunday entertainment in Jackson, Mississippi in the early 1900s. Yeah. So we, this is not new for us. This I'm is maybe not sick to my stomach hearing that. <laughs> yeah. This is not new. Right. And OCD has been something that people have decided, well, if you can bring something fun into mental health conditions, that's the condition to do it. Because there's not a lot of fun in depression, right? Uh, obviously, whatsoever. And people who are in manic spaces end up becoming amazingly destructive. But there's this notion that, okay, if you're going to have something and we can make a movie about it, we could put a twist on OCD or a TV series on it or something of that nature. And OCD became the butt of the joke for a lot of people, even though the World Health Organization at one point in time has listed OCD as one of the top 10 most disabling conditions in the world. We've put a spin on it that says, oh no, you know what OCD stands for? Obsessive Christmas disorder. And we put that on t-shirts and sweatshirts at Christmas time. Yeah. I have obsessive Christmas disorder or something like that. Realistically, the the functional impact of OCD on somebody's life can be very, very drastic. Oh, of course, there's a terrible. range, right? Mm -hmm. But what kind of limitations do you, do you see in, you know, you've been practicing for a long time. What are some of the types of ways that actually impact somebody's life every day? I've seen people have to get skin grafts because they were in a shower for 24 hours and they oh, literally... Wow because of 24 hours of water hitting their skin, uh, they damaged themselves. They needed to have emergency surgery because they couldn't get out of the shower. They didn't just feel that they were clean enough, right? Uh, I've seen people lose their jobs. I, people turn to substances as a way to try to neutralize some of these things. So now they go on to develop substance use. I opened the first treatment center in the world that treated people with both substance use and OCD at the same time the Foglia Family Foundation Residential Treatment Center outside of Chicago. And I did an interview once with someone who told me that they were on their 25th detox. And I was the first person to ever ask them about anxiety or OCD. Wow. Because, I mean, yeah, you can really, really see why that would be a temptation. What else are you going to do if you don't have proper tools to, you know, quiet that chatter and quiet that, that intrusion. And there's so much shame that comes with OCD too, especially with some of the subtypes. So one of the subtypes is pedophilic OCD, this fear uh -huh. of what if I were to harm a child? Well, you start telling your friends that and they're like, whoa, dude, you cannot come to my house anymore. Or, you know, I got kids or something like that. And, 
and it's so isolating and you feel so disgusted by some of these thoughts and images and urges that you feel that you're having and you think, oh my gosh, what can I do to quiet this down? And people have suicided because yeah. they just think that they're terrible people for even having these thoughts or they turn to substances as a way to try to neutralize it. Now, it's hard to talk about these things. I have a, a colleague who did an entire podcast about, you know, pedophilic OCD and someone out there who was an influencer said, oh, look at this guy. He's just trying to allow for pedophiles. He's making excuses. And he had to go off the air for a year because he was just slammed by so many people mm -hmm. and the followers of this person. So we, we don't want to accept science a lot in our society, right? We don't, we, we, we want to jump to conclusions right off the bat, but people with OCD are suffering. And what does OCD do? OCD takes the thing that's the most important thing to you and it turns it into doubt and insecurity. You may absolutely love children. You may have opened a daycare because you, your passion is just raising kids and making sure they're okay. But what and if, that's what OCD is going to attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. What if I did this because what if, X, Y, Z? What if. what if I actually want to do this? Yeah. I, yeah. I stood for three hours at a train track with someone once with them behind me and their hands on my shoulders and me yelling at them to push me into every train that came by because they were so afraid that they would kill people on train tracks by just pushing people all the way down the line onto the tracks and the train would just run them over. Now, I will tell you, Robert, I was not afraid. And, and I'd be more afraid of somebody without OCD behind me on a train track than I would be of somebody with OCD on a train track. Because I know the person with OCD is going to do everything they possibly can to make sure that nothing bad will ever happen. But our perception, sadly, in society is that thoughts equal reality. We call this thought-action fusion, this notion that thoughts are bad. And if you have a thought, it means that you want to do it. And if you go back to the 1960s, before Meyer's first work on ERP and OCD, the prevailing belief was compulsions are the very thing that stop people from going through with their obsessions. And therefore, you must let people do their compulsion. So that was until 1966. Wow. So we are now only 58 years past that, right? Yeah. That's how young we are in treating obsessive compulsive disorder in such a way that we can actually make an impact on people's lives. Yeah. So that's when we were relatively young in the productive treatment of this, because that's completely counterproductive what you were just describing. Oh, yeah. You want to keep someone stuck for the rest of their life, having them do compulsion. Yeah. Uh, the example of being on the train tracks and, and asking that person to push you or yelling at that person to push you, uh, a lot of people do have frightening, disturbing, sure, you know, intrusive thoughts. And I have seen people who are afraid of that. Does that mean I'm going to stab mm -hmm. my baby? Does that mean I'm going yeah. to X, Y, Z? Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, when you treat OCD as long as I have, you you develop every intrusive thought in the world because you absorb every intrusive thought that you've ever treated. Uh, Robert, you seem like a very nice person, but I promise if we were on a staircase right now, I'd contemplate throwing you down the stairs. And the reason is I've treated so many people who are afraid of what if I throw someone down the stairs that I now cannot take stairs anymore without contemplating the death of everybody on the staircase that I'm on. Uh, I've never once pushed anyone down the stairs, but I, I have thought about it constantly. I was in Paris two weeks ago, and I've been telling this story a lot lately, that um, along the River Seine there, there's this just lovely rock fence. You know, it's beautiful fence all along the way. It's very picturesque. And there's always people sitting on it. They're eating lunch. They're kissing on a date or something like that. And I, I spent the entire time walking along that fence thinking about the way that I could push every single person off the fence into the river. Uh, not that I wanted to, and not that I enjoyed it or anything. It just, I've treated so many people who have that kind of fear that I can't do anything now without those thoughts popping in my head. It did not ruin my trip. It did not have any interference whatsoever. In fact, it was, it was to me, it was just kind of like, oh yeah, I treat OCD because boy, look at what <laughs> the right. entire time. Kind of proof that you don't have OCD, right? You didn't get yeah, stuck. Yeah. You didn't yeah, you yeah, know, right. have to do anything about that. No, just was accepting that that's the way that it was. But if I had OCD and if I had thought of action fusion, I'd cross the street because I'd want to be as far away from people sitting on that fence as possible just to make sure that I don't accidentally do something. Because what if 
that were to happen? And what if I pushed somebody? And what if somebody fell? And what if they died? And then what if I was in a Paris jail for the rest of my life? And then I would lose my family and my friends would hate me and I'd die destitute and poor and alone and, and it would be a terrible, awful life. And so it's just best if I cross the street and stay away from the fence to prevent that from happening. Because otherwise, as you're going through that chain of what ifs, your body is also reacting to that, right? Totally. You are, you're yeah. getting, um, you're not in a situation that's actually dangerous, but your body doesn't know that. It feels oh, yeah. dangerous. You're, you're in the fight, flight, or freeze response then, right? And and again, that's why this is not a logical problem. This is an emotional problem because you know, I could tell you all day long, you're not going to push people and you're going to say to me, but what if I do? But what if I do? So it isn't about convincing you that people are safe and that you're not a killer. It's about learning just because that thought pops in my head doesn't mean I'm going to do anything about it. I mean, uh, I, if, if you cut me off in traffic, my first thought is I'm going to ram my car into you. I've never actually done it though. Right. But, but I think about it. I, I'm just going to tell you now. And everyone might leave this thinking that therapist is really violent or that therapist is just willing to share the intrusive thoughts that he has that everybody else probably has as well. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could go through, I do not have OCD. I could go through a list of very, you know, surprising, disturbing intrusive thoughts that I have had at mm -hmm. one point in time. I'm not going to, because that's yeah. not what we need to do, but I could. If, if, if many people could. Sure. Are people with OCD dangerous because they're OCD? Uh, tell me the one time you've read a newspaper ad that person with OCD actually goes and does that thing. Good point. Okay. So that's how dangerous they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not at all. Mm -hmm. Now, one area that I guess could be an exception would be somebody's danger to themselves. You talked about how people can be so overwhelmed that, yeah. you know, ending their life or something drastic feels like the best option to escape that. Is is that common in OCD? Yeah, more than the general public, yes. But that's a, usually a combination also of a major depressive disorder coming along or a pervasive depressive disorder coming along with OCD as well, too. If you look mm -hmm. at the definition of OCD and you think about OCD attacks the things that you love, and then if you look at the definition of major depressive disorder, and 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 number one is you feel depressed, and number two is You've lost interest or pleasure in things that you once enjoyed. Well, look at number two for a second. If I have OCD about stuff that I love and therefore I don't do it anymore, doesn't that dovetail nicely into number two for depression? I've lost interest or pleasure in things I once enjoyed. Why wouldn't you develop major depressive disorder if you have OCD then? Yeah. So very, very commonly they, they, they go together. Oh yeah. They're like brother and sister. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good point. Earlier, when you were talking about the train track thing, you said you were there for three hours. Yeah, it was an intensive outpatient program, so I had a lot of time with this person. So I got I was to gonna do say most people probably thought that is not what therapy sounds like. That's not my experience with with meeting with my yeah. therapist for fifty minutes over over Zoom each week. Sure, and and that's what we do at No CD. That's the standard, you know, hour kinds of sessions. But there are also partial hospital programs, which are six hours a day, four to five days a week. Intensive outpatient programs, which are three hours a day, four to five days a week. There's residential treatment centers, which are twenty four hours a day, and you might be there for thirty to sixty days. Mm. Talk to me a little bit about what doesn't work for OCD when it comes to actually sure. treating it. Ways that you might get that wrong. Ways therapists do get that wrong, and what does. Reassurance does not work. Assurance is fine. I can tell something, somebody something one time. That's fine. I don't retell them that though. So I always talk about mm -hmm. the five safety behaviors. And if you want to keep OCD around for the rest of your life, do the five safety behaviors. And the five safety behaviors are number one, avoid everything you're afraid of. Make sure anything bothers you, you avoid it constantly. Number two is get constant reassurance from everyone you know that you'll be fine and everything will be okay. And recognize that reassurance is also uh, builds a tolerance to it. It's kind of like a drug. So the more reassurance you get, the more you want. You can never get enough. Number three is distraction. So if you find yourself in a situation that's uncomfortable, just distract yourself as much as possible. The greatest distraction in the world is our phones. They're all within probably a foot of us right now. And if you find yourself in a uh, situation uncomfortable, 
you know, you jump on YouTube and you watch kittens running through a field. And aren't they just gorgeous, these little kittens? And oh, they're so cute. And yes, there's chaos going on around me, but whatever. I'm I'm watching kittens in a field. And and so you're not actually experiencing the thing you're you're distracting from. Number four, uh, take copious amounts of drugs or alcohol as a way to neutralize everything going on. And five, if you have OCD, do compulsions. And if you want to stay, you know, just as as stuck as you possibly can for the rest of your life, do those five things. If you want to overcome those problems, don't avoid stuff, face it. Do it without people promising you that you'll be fine and everything will be okay. Do it with no distractions, fully engage in the experience, be sober while doing it, and don't do any compulsion. But that's hard. Of course it's hard, right? But I'd contend that we've done that our entire life. So the therapy we do is called exposure and response prevention therapy. It's two parts. We purposely expose people to the intrusive thoughts and images and urges, and we have them not do safety behaviors. We have them not do compulsions, right? And we want them to be in the experience. Now, we don't throw you in the deep end of the pool for this. We stick a toe in the water and we see how it feels and we build up from there. And that's how we do it. But I would contend that all of us have done that our entire lives. Uh, Robert, I don't know. Are, if, if you, are you, do you walk, Robert, or are you in a wheelchair? Uh, I walk. Yeah. You walk. Okay. 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 So, so Robert, when you were a child, that means at one point you stood up and you probably fell. And at that point, you could have said, well, that sucked. I'm never doing that again. And you crawled for the rest of your life. Or, Robert, do you know how to ride a bicycle? Yep. Okay. So you probably started on a big wheel or a green machine. If you were the cool kid, you had a green. And then you had a tricycle. And then you had a bike with training wheels. And then you had a, those came off. And then a parent was holding the back of the seat. And eventually they let you go and you promptly fell. At which point you could have said, well, that sucked. I'm never doing that again. But what you probably did was tried it again and tried it again and tried it again and tried it again. And you kept exposing yourself to this uncomfortable thing and doing it until you mastered it. And that's all that I'm asking people to do as well, too. I want you to expose yourself to things that are uncomfortable and learn there's a different way to react to them than the safety behaviors that you have developed as the way to react. Hmm. The safety behaviors are kind of a form of avoidance, right? Yeah. I mean, avoidance, reassurance, distraction, substance use, compulsions. Yes, they're, they, they might all kind of be labeled under the general aspect of potentially avoidance in some ways, but um, it's not just I think reassurance itself, it's is... The, it's the feeling too, right? It's like when I, yeah. have, when I have this thought, I hate the way that it makes me feel and I need to get away yeah. from that feeling. Yeah. And, and we get this notion that feelings are bad and, and you know, that's why people who are having panic attacks run to emergency rooms, even though no one has ever died of a panic attack ever. Uh, we, but it feels like it, it might be happening. And therefore, and, and we have statements in our society. We talk about trust your gut, right? You know, if, if you feel it, it, it must be true. But the reality is, is that OCD is the great manipulator and OCD manipulates your fight, flight, or freeze response, your feeling center. OCD is not a logical problem. Again, it's an emotional problem. And, and the location of OCD, in, even in the brain, more in the midbrain than anything else, the midbrain does not have a language processing center. Uh, language is all processed in the cortex, that outer part of the brain. The midbrain is all fight, flight, or freeze emotion stuff. And so OCD occurs there. So if you're trying to do a talk therapy for OCD, you're not even touching it because OCD is located in a section of the brain that doesn't even process language. Mm -hmm. You know, that makes a lot of sense um, now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, right. I'm a neuropsychologist and mm -hmm. I know that we can give animals OCD, right? They don't have the kind of language centers we do. So obviously mm -hmm. they're not doing complex reasoning to arrive at this right. OCD. So it's got to be more primitive in those earlier parts of our brain. You got it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Interesting <laughs> to think that. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. A lot of therapists probably do uh, their best effort, but a really poor job of working with OCD if they don't have the proper experience and training, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of therapists hold the notion that therapy should be comfortable and you should leave the session feeling better than you did when you got to it. And I like people to leave feeling like they ran a marathon. Mm -hmm. I want mm -hmm. people to be like, that was exhausting, but boy, did I learn a lot. The burn means it's working. 
Yeah. And then you practice outside of the session as well, too. Because if you go to piano lessons and you only play the piano during piano lessons, you only get a half hour better a week. You've got to take it outside of the piano lesson as well, too. And you have to do that with therapy as well. In treating anxiety disorders, I know that consistency and duration are the things that I see people get wrong the most. You know, if you're going mm -hmm. through some sort of hierarchy, people not focusing on staying for an extended period in that experience and doing it as often as possible are really limiting factors. Is it pretty similar for ERP? 100%. Mm -hmm. In fact, and I use ERP for all anxiety disorders too. So I do an interoceptive ERP for panic where we have people do things like run in place, hyperventilate, breathe through straws, spin in chairs, experience panic symptoms, learn that they can handle them. Phobias, we gradually expose people to things. Trauma, we expose people to the memories of the traumatic event because they keep trying not to think of it which just creates the pink elephant effect. If once you try not to think something, you're guaranteed to think it. So I, I, my, you know, kind of way of approach in this is always exposure and response prevention are key learning experiences for us when these anxiety and fight, flight, or freeze response emotions are triggered. So you have, uh, you're the chief clinical officer for no CD. Correct. Um, how do you do ERP online? How do you how how do you guys approach it, and and why is this a a special kind of organization mm -hmm. that you have going on here? I love doing it online, and I'll give you an example. If in the old days, when you came to my office and you said, "I'm very afraid that I leave my stove on." I didn't have a stove in my office. So we'd have to pretend my desk was the stove and the knobs on my desk were the knobs on the stove. And I'd put red construction paper circles on four spots on the, on the desk to, these are the hot burners and everything. And I see the red and all that kind of stuff. And now what I can do is say, well, go to your stove and let's do the therapy session right there. And, oh, and you know what? I'm going to go to my stove too. And I'm going to do, do it here at, at my house right along with you. you know, I, I live alone. So for me, I got the run of the house. I can do anything that I want here whatsoever. Right. And so that to me is the beauty of it. I, I am so much more in the lives of people doing ERP virtually than I ever was doing it in an office. And even for hoarding work, right. I'd have to drive an hour to get to their house. I do the hour session, then an hour drive back. That's a three hour charge for someone. And now I'm saving them two hours of charge by just saying, turn the camera around. Let me see your house. Yeah. I didn't even think about that, but absolutely. Uh, the mm -hmm. in vivo without the in vivo part. I mean, it is, it is. Yeah, it, it is. Um, that's a really unique way that technology has facilitated this. Yeah. It's been, it's been absolutely wonderful. And so the other thing is like, I can. Let's say somebody has a, a harm-based OCD where they think, what if I have a knife on me and I were to stab people at the mall or something? And, and they spend hours checking their pockets to make sure there's not a knife on them or something. So I can say, okay, take your phone, put it in your, your breast pocket of your shirt so the camera's facing out, put your earbuds in. When you get to the mall, we'll do your session and I'm going to be able to see through the camera everything that you're, you're seeing as you're walking through the mall, and I'm going to be in your ears. But no one knows we're doing a therapy session. Right. And so we'll talk about, well, we might have a knife on us. So instead of avoiding people, let's walk next to people. Let's go sit down in the middle of the food court and even uh, order something and get a plastic knife and use the plastic knife to cut your food while you're sitting in the food court and allow you to learn, okay, I can handle this intrusive thought or image that I have about harming people because that's all that it is. It's, it's an intrusive, intrusive thought. That's so cool. Cause people in that situation, if you were just doing kind of, um, in the office or asynchronous where you're stuck at a desk or something like that, even if it is virtual, they may not ever be able to approach those things without the additional support of having you there live, at least for the first time to, to ease into it. Correct. And now I can be there with them for it. Wow. So how, and, how does, yeah, go ahead. I just add one thing too. Um, most OCD specialists were prior to COVID located in large cities. 
which meant if you lived in a rural area, you had to drive for hours to get to see someone. And now you need an internet connection. Mm. And you can be linked to a specialist. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about NoCD. How, how, what is it? How does it work? And, and, and why is it there? So NoCD will do a free 15 minute call with someone to get them set up uh, to meet with a therapist who's been specifically trained in exposure and response prevention therapy. The reason we're there is our founder, Stephen Smith, had OCD, was misdiagnosed five times. And finally, when he met someone who treated OCD, oh, and by the way, he found out he had OCD by doing an online search of his symptoms. Nobody, nobody ever told him that he had OCD. He figured it out himself. And so when he finally met somebody who could treat it, they had a seven month wait list and they charged like 300 an hour and he was in college and they didn't take insurance. And Stephen, after the experience of luckily a family friend helped to pay for something and he got in to see the therapist, he got the treatment that he needed. He thought, this is not a therapy problem. There's a really great therapy, but this is a logistical problem. We're, we're not getting it to the people who need, who need it. And so that was the birth of NoCD was what can we do to start to bring the right kind of treatment to the people who need the treatment. Mm. And that's why we exist today and why we're in all 50 states and why we take insurance because we want it to be affordable for people and we want it to be accessible to people. You said you take insurance. So we do. does that mean basically all major insurances or, or how does that play out? Yeah. And that's growing all the time. There's 180 million covered lives in the U S and we're at about 140 million right now. So there's still more to, to work on and we are working on those. And then, then you go into Medicare's and Medicaid's and all those kinds of things. And you go into that next level of, of things. So there's a lot of work that we're still doing to try to make this happen and to try to make this accessible and affordable to everybody. Wow. Out of curiosity, as it stands, do you guys take Medicare? Uh, we're working on it. Not yet, okay. but we, we, uh, we're in, there's, there, believe me, there's a lot of paperwork on that one. I am a Medicare provider, so yep. I, I, I know uh, that that's a, that's a big pain. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, it is, it is something we are in the process of, of going through. So removing barriers to accessing treatment is, is kind of a really important thing for you guys. Huge. Yeah, yeah, huge. We don't want people suffering, right? What can we do to end the mental health crisis around, at first, OCD, but then in general, by being able to connect people to the right providers that they need? Yeah. How do you find and vet the providers versus just, you know, somebody who lists OCD on their Psychology Today profile? Yeah, well, we do a pretty extensive interview, and then once people are in, they go through a very substantial training process with us. So... There's a great deal of didactics for the first two weeks. There's um, group and individual, what we call CAMs, or experiences where they have to practice and show that they've taken what they've learned in the didactics and can apply it. We have management systems in there to assure that people are working with and retaining the members that they are assigned to. Um, I can assess on the back end all of the scores that people have done, how they've done in terms of score changes over the course of time. I can train or retrain certain therapists if necessary based on outcomes. And so we, we are constantly looking at all of this to assure that our network is continuously getting better and better over time. Wow. So is that a lot of what you have implemented there in terms of the, yes. the the clinically training the providers and making sure that you are on the same page about the approach and things like that? That is correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's a very different, from what I know, a very different way of doing it than a lot of other online therapy platforms in general. Yeah. Nothing annoys me more than going on to a certain platform and looking up a therapist and they say, I specialize in and then they list 27 different things, yeah. which I just think is bullshit. Sorry. Yeah. But, no, absolutely. I mean, that is shit. Sorry. But, but right, that you, you cannot specialize. Sure. So, you know, if you look up my profile, it says OCD, anxiety disorders, exposure, and response prevention therapy. Right. That's, that's what it's going to list. 
and, and I'm good at those things and I've stuck my life to those things and, and I can feel confident calling myself an expert treating those things. But I, you know, if somebody comes and says, well, can you treat me for my schizophrenia? I say, no, I, I don't, it's not, it's not what I'm an expert in. So I'm, I'm going to help you find somebody who is, but it's just, it's not my thing. It's not my area. It's not what I know about. My family, I think, thinks I'm dumb in some ways because sometimes they'll ask me about some non-OCD thing psychologically. I'll be like, I don't know. <laughs> just, no idea. Yeah. I'd have to go look that up. I don't know. Sure. They're like, hey, I'm like, so hey what does this Rorschach shock mean? And yeah. you're like, yeah, I, it beats me. Looks like somebody spilled. I don't know what that is. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so within the NoCD platform, um, one of the issues you talked about with prior to tools like this is being uh, on a long wait list or something like that. Is that addressed at all through through this platform? Can people get help relatively quickly? How does that oh, yeah. work out? Yeah, I mean, our goal is to try to get everyone in within seven days. Uh, that's that's what we set as a goal for ourselves. And we're very good at that, you know. Wow. Uh, depending though on, sometimes that can be longer depending on if a member wants like, a male or a female therapist or, or someone of a certain demographic or something like that. So it just, uh, that, that might be longer depending, or if they want somebody who takes insurance, I might have people who aren't yet on that panel in that state. So it might take another month to get them paneled. To, to get, gotcha. So it just, some of those things are always at play, but for the most part, we try to get people in within seven days. And the longer the organization's around, the less that will be a barrier because you'll have more people that are vetted, you'll have correct. more people on the different panels and things like that. That is correct. That brings a curiosity. So in, you know, if you're talking about talk therapy, you know, CBT, psychodynamic therapy or something like that, uh, the, the fit between the therapist and the patient in terms of, you know, how well they match and just the rapport matters a whole lot. Is yeah. that still true for ERP? Is it different in any sure. way? Yeah. I mean, if you meet with your therapist and you're not satisfied and you want someone else, we'll, we'll set you up with somebody else. So okay. here, here's the thing. We are highly working on and training all of our therapists to spend that very first session they meet with anyone developing good rapport. Because if I'm going to ask you to share things that are the scariest things in the world to you with me, you better trust me. You better like me. You better think I'm worth talking to. And if I'm not that person, that's fine. Let me help you find that person. It doesn't have to be me, but I don't want it to be nobody. Mm. And what about people who I, I feel, I could be wrong about this, but I, I my gut tells me, eh, I guess that's a loaded term in this conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I feel that there are a lot of people out there who are on the fence. They don't know if they have OCD or maybe they don't yeah. feel like they're OCD enough to get treatment for it. How can those people navigate this situation? Come in and do a diagnostic eval with us and uh, see if you meet criteria. And here's the thing. We, we have categories too. So there's obsessive compulsive disorder, but as you know, we have OCD not otherwise specified or, you know, just maybe you don't meet all the very full criteria for it, but you meet enough that it's still very treatable. Let's OCD in the DSM says it's an hour a day and maybe yours is only 45 minutes a day. I don't care. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I could still treat that. So, so I, it may not get the full OCD diagnosis. You might get this not specified diagnosis or whatever, but guess what? The therapy will apply to you. So keep coming, do the therapy, get the help. There's no need to suffer. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. I liken that to trauma, right? Do you have the full... PTSD diagnosis? Maybe not. Have you been through something really bad and now it's giving you a really hard time? Yes. You're still, mm -hmm. you can still get help for that. Yeah, absolutely. Don't suffer. Yeah. Well, I, I really love what you are doing and I love what, what no CD is doing. Where can people find out more about this if they are curious? Do they sure. just go to nocd.com? Is there an app yep. to download? How does that work? Nocd.com is where you can go. Um, you can sign up for a free 15-minute chat with our care team. We do have an app as well. It's a free app, the NoCD app. So you could go on iPhone uh, or Google Play or uh, iStore. I, I don't know what that I'm sorry. 
<laughs> I leave that to the tech people. I'm I'm the therapy guy. I don't you know, but no. Yeah. Um, but anywhere that you get your apps and anything, yes, the the No CD app is available as well too. And then uh, if you're interested, the Get to Know OCD uh, podcast, you can subscribe to the No CD YouTube channel, or you can get the Get to Know OCD podcast wherever you get your favorite podcast from as well. Awesome. Is there anything else before I let you go that you would like to just impart on people, whether that's yeah. speaking directly to people with OCD or people that don't have it, anything that you want to just let people know? Thought action fusion is a really believable thing to people who have it, right? This notion that thoughts equal an action, thoughts are as bad as an action, or an image is as bad as doing or having something happen, or an urge is as bad as doing something. And that's what OCD uses to trick you and to keep you stuck, is this thought action fusion kind of thing. So what I want people to realize is this, that you can think anything, you can have an image of anything, you can have an urge about anything. It doesn't have to mean anything whatsoever. It doesn't mean that it is a harbinger of something to come. But that's what OCD does to trick you and lie to you is it says, ooh, that's a bad thing. And uh, now that might happen because of you having the thought or the image or urge. And you better do this compulsion just to knock it off. And so if we can help people break that cycle, we can get people to live the life they want to live and not the life that OCD wants them to live. And then we're golden. That's where we want to be. Amazing. It's been really good talking to you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. It was a great time. Appreciate it.